So today our presenter is Wendy Chang. Wendy received her bachelor's degree in microbiology with a minor in chemistry from California State University, Long Beach, and a master's degree in environmental science from Loyola Marymount University. She has assisted in method development and validation studies for pharmaceutical and personal care product industries. Since 1998, Wendy has worked at Bioscreen, formerly overseeing the microbiology department. Now she serves as the Director of Operations at our ALS Bioscreen Laboratory in Torrance, California. Today, Wendy will be discussing micro, microbial <laughs> examination of non-sterile products. Wendy, thank you for taking your time to deliver this presentation today, and I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Uh, thank you for taking time of your busy schedule to listen in on the um, the importance of the um, testing for non sterile products. Before we begin, I um, want to just kind of a little disclaimer out there. This information provided in the presentation is solely on my opinion. It doesn't represent any um, perspective of ALS Global. Corp, Bioscreen, and any other regulatory agencies. So brief agenda, uh, we'll want to go through the background of the type of product, why is it important to perform this analysis, and the details of each of the methods as to the amount of samples to test, and the requirements of each of the methods, the USB 60, 61, 62, and the recommended specification, and of course, at the end to address any questions that you may have. So USP has uh, the chapters on doing microbial examination of non-store products for numerous years. Um, before it was called USB 60 as microbial limits test, then in May of 2009, it evolved and split into 61 and 62, and with a total of nine different tests. Then in December of last year, they added the USP-60 of detecting Burkholderia sepatia. So this has been around for quite some time. Why is it important? Um, microbes are everywhere. You see it on your skin, you have it on your desk, your food, it's everywhere. But why is it important to look for these? The organism itself, it can degrade products and it, especially in personal care or OTC products like sunscreen, it can create foul smell and it can also decolorize products. But for drugs, it can inactivate potency or any therapeutic effects on the product, which then can cause adverse effect on end users, especially immunocompromised patients and the young and old generations. Therefore, it is important for companies or manufacturers to ensure that products are safe with low level of organisms by following the proper GMP during the manufacturing process. The type of products to test, mainly any non store products with active ingredients like sunscreens, anti-dandruff shampoos, even some of the homeopathic uh, medicines that's out there, the raw materials, patches, um, tablets, and APIs. So when GMP are not um, followed properly, recalls can occur. I'm sure all of us had heard many recalls throughout the years, and these are just examples of ones recently within the last couple of years where it's the um, medications for fluid and coal had high level microbial contaminations, uh, tablets with um, gram negative organisms, supplements that is above the specified level, um, gripe water, um, also wipes uh, with contaminated with Bocadera sepatia and also hand soap with gram negative organisms and I could go on and on. So we want to minimize these types of recalls because obviously with recalls there is um, time loss and which in turn turns into money loss.
And here is just a few websites for um, recall alert in the U.S., um, in Canada, and Europe. I'm sure there are others out there, um, but these are the three main ones. So let's start and go into the details of the methodology. Um, we get um, requests of how much samples to test. Um, you know, samples are um, expensive. And um, so how much, what is the minimum that we will need to test? USP has a very good guideline of for general products, it's, it's 10 grams or 10 mils per analysis. Now for aerosols, it's generally composite of the 10 containers. Patches is 10 units. Now for APIs or products that are limited or still in clinical trial, the amount can be decreased, but it should be justified. Now it is also important to do random sampling. Organisms are not homogeneous throughout batches, especially in um, lotions or shampoo thick viscous products. So it is very important to sample for testing as in beginning of the manufacturing line, middle or end, or top, middle, bottom of the tanks. So you'll notice as we go on that each of the chapter will consist of media growth promotion, the suitability test, and obviously the testing of the product. The growth promotion, it, each batch of the media is required to be tested to ensure, the, to ensure that it supports the growth of microorganisms when present. And it's generally inoculated with low level organisms such as less than 100 CFU. Now, for its selective augers, such as McConkie, it need to prove that it supports the growth of the required organism while inhibiting others. And it is required per each batch of the uh, media. Now, for suitability tests, it's the terminologies had evolved through the years as well before it was known as the prep or the preparatory test or the validation. So why is it required? Now, obviously, to meet the USB guideline, it must be tested. But the theory is that the products are generally known to have antimicrobial properties because of the presence of preservatives of the or of its formulation. So therefore, these must be neutralized by various methods such as dilution, filtration, or the combo, and to make sure that we are able to inactivate the um, preservative and allow the growth to detect the growth of the organism. So therefore we don't receive a false negative result. And suitability tests is performed on a clean product. Sometimes we would see products that are contaminated and when you're spiking with low number of organisms in the suitability test, you can't interfere with the test and we wouldn't get accurate results. So therefore it is um, recommended to test with remotely clean um, product. And then the testing of the products, um, we will go through that in much detail in the future slides. So let's go through USB 60, the test of Brocoderia sapatia complex. This is new. This is the one that was just effective in December 2019. So what are the B. sapatia complex? It is a group of gram-negative bacteria in the Brocoderia um, species where it's generally found in soil and water. And it is also grown in bile salt in presence of bile salt, and it's a non-lactose fermenter. So th the group, these are gr um, examples of some of the um, Bocodera sapatia that is in this um, complex. So sapatia, seno sapatia, multivorans, and so on and so forth. And these organisms can degrade products and also cause infections. As of right now, this chapter is not harmonized with EPJP, but I foresee that it will in the future. 
So in the chapter, the Richmond broth is the TSB, the triptych soy broth. And the selective auger is called the Brocteris sapatia selective auger. The organisms that we have to test each of the media to make sure it growth promotes is sapatia, sapatia, or multivorin. And it, may, it also must inhibit the growth of uh, Pseudomonas originosa and Staphylococcus aureus. So the suitability test, generally it would, you prepare a dilution of the product and then at that dilution you would spike with less than 100 CFU of the required organism. Then you want to incubate that for the least amount of time that is required in the USP chapter. So in this case, it's 40 hours at 30 to 35 degrees. Once that is completed, you would subculture that and streak onto the selective auger and then incubate that again at the least amount of time at 48 hours and at also at 30 to 35 degrees. Then you're looking for the typical growth. Now, if you don't see that growth, then that means the antimicrobial property is still present at the dilution tested, and therefore you could either increase dilution, add additional neutralizers such as polysorbate 80 or lecithin, or switch to filtration method for liquids um, if it's um, suitable. Once you have a passing suitability test, then you could proceed with the actual test of the sample. And the procedure process is exactly the same as the suitability test using the same dilution, except that you don't spike with organisms. So in this case, you, if it passes, the suitability passes at one to 10, then you would make that dilution and go through the same procedure. And you look for the growth. Now, if if the growth is present, then you're required to do an identification to see what that organism is. So USP61, the microbial enumeration test, you'll hear it known as aerobic plate count, east of mole count, TAMC, TYMC, um, APC, east of mole. So there's a lot of acronyms for this um, test. And basically it's to quantify the amount of bacteria and fungal in aerobic conditions. The, in the chapter, there are three different methods. Two of them, the first two are the um, once the widely used, the pore plate method and the filtration method. The NPM method, the multiple twos number method, it still exists, um, but it is not reliable for fungal count. And this chapter is harmonized with EP and JP. The media that used uh, for testing for the dilution, it's PBS. And then for the bacteria, looking for bacteria organism is TSA or TSA-based augers such as T-salt, which is TSA with lecithin or polysorbate 80. And then the fungal is SDA subrodextrose auger. The growth promotion organisms are for the bacteria are Staph aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Bacillus septalis. And for the fungal is Canada albicans and Aspergillus brasiensis. Very similar to USP60, the suitability test is also inoculating each of the growth promoting media organisms um, with less than 100 CFU. So you'll make a dilution in the case of 1 to 10 and you inoculate that with less than 100 CFU and then you plate that out. Concurrently, you would do control plates without the product and incubate that concurrently. At the end of the incubation period, you want to compare the growth between the control and the test sample and the recovery needs to be 50 to 200%. Now, if you don't achieve that, then you would increase dilution, add neutralizers, or switch to different methods, filter, such as filtration methods. Once you have it passing, then you would also 
um, you can repeat the test without the spiking of the organisms and then you make sure that you perform at the same dilution that where your suitability passed on. So for membrane filtration method, um, generally it's done for products that has very low specification, like less than one CFU, or if you're able, not able to have a passing result in the pore plate method. So the idea is that you put the product in some type of buffer or a dilution, then you filter that through um, in a 0.45 micron filter. Then you would rinse the filter first twice with a generally it's a hundred ml of um, rinse fluid such as fluid D or fluid A, and then at the last hundred ml you would spike that with organisms less than a hundred uh, CFU. Then you will filter that through and place the filter onto the auger plate. You will also concurrently do that the same without the product and then you compare the growth. Now the, again, the recovery also is to achieve 50 to 200%. And if that is not met, what you could do is increase the rinse fluid to um, another level, but not more than 500 ml. Or you could add neutralizers or switch to another different broth media. Then once your suitability passes, then you could repeat the process without the spiking of the organism and test the sample by preparing the same dilution, rinse the filter it, rinse this same amount of rinse fluid, and then put the filter on the plate. The last method for the enumeration is the NPM method. It is very similar to the food testing, the FDA BAM testing for something like E. coli. So what you would do is perform three serial dilutions, generally 10, one to 10, one to 100, and one to 1,000. And each of those you spike with less than 100 CFU. Then you would incubate that and for not more than three days, and then examine, compare the growth um, with the control and compare it with the, um, the MPN table that is listed in the USP. The criteria is that it needs to be within the 95% confidence level. Now for if for products that renders the media turbid, then you're required to subculture onto a auger plate and examine that for growth. Once again, once the suitability passes, um, you would mimic that same procedure without the organisms and Exam then at the end, look for growth at each of the dilution tube and evaluate based on the table that is in the USP. So for example, if you're negative um, at one to 10, you, got, you see no growth. And then at negative one to 100 and one to 1,000, you also see no growth. Though that means that you have less than three MPM per gram with a confidence level of zero to 9.4. Now, something to be aware is that MPM per gram is not equivalent to CFU per gram. They're very much different. There's not one-to-one -one correlation. So let's switch to USP62, the test for specified organisms. Before in the USB 60, they were only looking for four pathogens, but now there is a total of seven different types of pathogens. Um, there's the biotolerant gram negative, the, the E. coli, Salmonella, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Canada albicans, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, and Clostridium. Now, all these methods are mainly presence absent, except for biotolerance gram negative. There is both methods, there's the quantitative and the presence absence. And again, these are, this method is harmonized with EP and JP. 
so we'll go into for the bile tolerant gram negative rod. The media, the broth media is TSB, and the selective broth is the in, enterobacteria enrichment broth, and the auger is the violet red bioglucose auger. And the organism for growth promoting, allowing it to grow are E. coli and Pseudomonas, but inhibiting gram positive coxie like Staph aureus. So very similar to the USP 60 and 61, on the suitability test, again, you're inoculating with less than 100 CFU of the organism and incubate them for the, at the minimum time required. So in this case, you would inoc you will make the dilution of the product, inoculate, and then incubate for not more than two hours, and then transfer that into enterobacter enrichment broth, and then incubate that for another 24 hours at a higher temperature. Then when growth is observed, then you would subculture that into the violet, violet red bioglucose auger and then incubate that for not more than 18 hours. Then you're looking for the growth. It's very similar to the other process. If you are seeing um, where the growth is not detected or inhibited, um, you will need to increase your sample dilution, neutralizers, or switch to filtration. Once that is, once the suitability pass, then you would, you would repeat the test using the same test parameters, except without the organism. Same dilution. In this case, you have a range of incubation a period instead of the minimum two or the 18 hours, you have a range of um, incubation period required. Now, if at the end, if you see typical growth, you would want to submit that for ID and see what that organism is. For E. coli, the media, are, the enrichment broth is the TSB again, and but the selective auger and broth are McConkie broth and auger. So this one, you're allowing the growth of E. coli, but inhibiting the growth of um, gram positives like pseudomon, uh, I'm sorry, like Staphylococcus aureus. Again, for suitability tests, you're inoculating again low lump, low levels at a less than 100 CFU and incubating them at the minimum required level. So in this case, it's 18 hours at 30 to 35. Then you transfer to the selected broth and auger and then look for the growth. Once the suitability passed, then you can proceed with the testing and um, incubate that at the required range that's listed in the USP. Now, for this one, you will see growth on the E. coli, but there are, um, to determine if it is the E. coli, you would need to do an identification because there are some gram negatives, um, such as salmonella, that will grow in the same auger, but um, it won't give you the same characteristics. So it's always good to um, perform an identification on. For salmonella, um, the enrichment broth is still TSB, and, but the selective broth is the salmonella enrichment broth and the auger is um, XLD auger. The organisms to uh, support the growth are salmonella typhi and albany and inhibiting staph aureus. Okay, suitability test for salmonella is very similar if it, except the difference of the incubation period and the media. You're also inoculating less than 100 CFU and incubating that at a minimal um, minimal temperature, I'm sorry, minimal time period at the required temperature and transferring into the selective broth and auger. In this case, you're looking for the growth of a black colony sometime with and without the zone.
then for the test itself, as perform the dilution that passed the suitability test, and then you would go through this sim very similar process and looking for the typical growth and identification at the end if the growth is observed. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, the enrichment broth is also TSB. The selective auger in this case is cetramide auger. The growth promoting organism is the it's the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but inhibiting the growth of E. coli. Very similar to the other methods, um, in, again, inoculating with less than 100 CFU and incubating at the minimal time period and looking for the growth on the auger plates. Then once the test passes, the suitability test passes, then you would repeat the test using the same dilution. And then looking for the growth on the cetramide auger. If growth is observed, then you would want to do an identification to see if the organism is indeed a Pseudomonas aeruginosa or other types of Pseudomonas. For staph detection of Staphylococcus aureus, on the media enrichment broth, it is still TSB. Um, the selective auger is mannitol salt auger. So growth promoting media is Staphylococcus aureus, but inhibiting the growth of um, gram negatives such as E. coli. For the suitability test, um, again, not getting less than 100 CFU and incubating at the minimal time. In this case, you're looking for um, yellow zone, growth of the yellow zone onto the mannitol salt auger. And if growth is observed, then it meets the criteria. And if it doesn't, then similar to the others, you'll increase dilution, add neutralizers, or switch to a different methods such as filtration. Once the suitability passes, then you would do the same dilution and repeat the test without the organism and looking for the growth. Now, there are some organisms that will grow on the mannitol, like a um, gram-positive ROS, like Bacillus um, species. So therefore, you would want to do an identification or at least a minimum of gram staining to see what um, the growth is. Now for Clostridium, so generally this um, t organism is performed for aerosol type products due to its packaging or it can be included, um, it should be included for products or raw materials from animal origins um, due to the risk of uh, fecal contamination, especially with or with raw materials that are um, comes from nature. So in this case for enriched the media enrichment broth, it's called reinforced uh, medium for Clostridia. The broth itself is, when you look at it, it's so slightly viscous than TSB to allow the anaerobe uh, condition. The selective auger in this case is Columbia auger, and the growth promoting organism is the Clostridium sporogenes. The test method for Clostridium is slightly different. Um, it is in the same where you are spiking with less than 100 CFU, but you're, you, after preparing the initial dilution, the, that portion is split into two. Where first one, you're um, going to heat shock at 10 minutes at 80 degrees. Once you do that for 10 minutes, you want to quickly cool it in an ice bath, and then you, then the other replicate is um, tested as is. Then you transfer that into um, the reinforced clostridial and incubate those for an, at 40, no more than 48 hours anaerobically. Clostridium is a strict anaerobe, so all the test conditions um, of the broth and auger plates are incubated anaerobically. Once the suitability passes, then you would repeat the test without the organism. In this case, 
Also, if you're if you see growth on the Columbia auger, you should do an identification and see what type of clostridium or other anaerobe is there. So last but not least, the last organism in USP62 is the Canada albicans. In this case, you're, the broth is the sabrodextrose broth and the auger is the SDA, the sabrodextrose auger. And the growth promoting organism is Canada albicans. For the suitability test, um, it is also incubated at less than 100 CFU, but these are incubated at a higher temperature different than the um, enumeration test for the Easton mole. In this case, you're incubating at a longer time at, at three days, but at 30 to 35 rather than 20 to 25. And you're looking for a growth of white colonies. Once the suitability passes, then you repeat the process without the organism. And you want to do an identification. If you see the growth on the auger place, then you will want to proceed with the identification. So let's switch gears to the recommended criteria. Um, we get, I get questions a lot, with, especially with companies that are new or they have a new line of product and they want to see um, what the recommended specs that they could, they should um, put it for their product. So it really depends on the root administration. So each of the chapter, um, the USP, the EP, and the JP, um, they have their criteria very similar. In this case, for like. Um, gingival use, the aerobic plate count, you're looking at um, not more than 100 CFU, and the Easter mole is not more than 10. And the two pathogens that minimum you are to test is for Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas. Now for the EP, it's exactly very similar to the USP, except it also has two specs for um, for what they call the EP special provision on oral dosage products with um, raw materials from natural origin. So in this case, it's uh, looking for um, 10,000 CFU for aerobic plate count and then 100 for Easter mole and also looks for um, the four different types of pathogens. And then the JP has a little bit more, very similar to the USP and EP. And then it also has a criteria for the crude drug product, which is very similar to the EP on the natural um, raw materials. And this, but the specification is slightly higher and the organist, specified organisms to test is a little bit different. So that concludes um, the presentation. Um, I, I hope that you get a better understanding of the method and why it does take um, about a week for from the beginning to end. Um, and feel free to ask any questions. Yes, thank you, Wendy. We will go ahead and open it up for questions at this time. You can either write out your questions in the chat section at the bottom right, or you can update your status to raise your hand. You can verbally ask Wendy your question. We'll go ahead and give everyone a few moments. I don't see any additional questions, but I do want to remind everybody that, um, again, we do record our webinar presentations and we do email them uh, to everyone on this who attended today once that webinar recording is available to view. We do have one question that just came in. It says, is the bile tolerant gram negative bacteria mandatory for OTC like sunscreen? 
It, as of right now, it is on the OTC side. It, it does not appear so, but I would recommend it because of the nature of gram negative. It's um, generally for sunscreen, um, you would have uh, water in it. So I would recommend testing, testing for it. I don't see any additional questions. So again, Wendy's information is listed here if you did want to email her directly with any specific follow-up questions from her presentation today. As a reminder, you will be receiving um, her contact information as well in that email that you will be getting. I wanna thank everyone for attending our webinar Wednesday today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week.